Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Today, we are joined by Hillary Erickson with PullingCurls.com. Now, Hillary has been blogging since 2005. That's almost 20 years now. And so we get a fascinating story about someone who started with a mom blog, turned that website into a champion on Pinterest, driving lots and lots of traffic into a site that covers a variety of topics and makes the bulk of its income by selling prenatal courses, uh, among other things. So Hillary brings us up to speed on the entire journey from the start of it in 2005, where she was blogging as a mom blogger, uh, posting you know discount ideas and these sorts of things, all the way into the mid-2000s when Pinterest was at its height and driving tons of traffic to the site, to where it is now. And now it's doing very well. Pulling Curls is pulling in pardon the pun, uh, anywhere between twelve to fifteen to $16,000 a month, with more than half of that coming from the different courses that she offers. She also does have some affiliate side of the business and some ad revenue coming in from Mediavine, but the bulk of it is coming in from her courses. So we walk through course creation, um, how to create a course, uh, how much tech you need for that course, uh, where to put the course, where to focus your efforts on the course, and really get into the nitty gritty of what's successful about it. She also shares some great topics to consider for your website uh, around the idea of topical authority. In many ways, her website bucks the trend by talking about a lot of different topics. Uh, We talk about TikTok, we talk about Pinterest and where these platforms are going nowadays, um, and a whole bunch of other topics along the way. I think you're gonna really find today interesting, if you have a website and you're not doing things like monetizing with courses, not driving people to an email list, you're gonna get a lot out of what Hillary has to share and just some great inspiration. Someone who gets up every single day, uh, works hard and is making um, a full-time income from her online website. So enjoy. Today's show is sponsored by Ahrefs, an all-in-one SEO tool set. Do you wish you could get more traffic to your website from Google? Well, half the battle is understanding what you need to fix on your site first. One route is to hire a costly consultant, but we've all been there, we've all done that, and there is another way. What if you could get a professional website audit for free without having to deal with the salespeople or the consultants? And that's the power of Ahrefs Webmaster Tools. It's a free resource that's gonna help you prioritize the optimization opportunities on your website which in the long run means more Google traffic. You'll see which keywords your pages are currently ranking for. It helps you understand how Google currently sees your content and probably most importantly, helps you discover what changes you can make and how those changes will help you blow up your traffic. Imagine what this could do for your business in the long run. So I use Ahrefs every single day at my marketing agency. It's a fantastic tool, really love it. Uh, You can learn more by visiting ahrefs.com slash webmaster dash tools. And again, it's a free tool and we've included that link in the show notes for you. Again, go ahead and visit ahrefs.com slash webmaster dash tools. Thanks again to Ahrefs for sponsoring today's episode. Have you been frustrated with your Google traffic lately? Are you tired of tools that make you search through millions of keywords and require a math degree to figure out? there's an SEO tool called Rank IQ that can help. They're ranked number one on G2 for both ease of use and customer satisfaction. Rank IQ gives you a list of the lowest competition, high traffic keywords in your niche, and they are all clear winners. When you choose one of their hand-picked keywords, their AI takes over and gives you a simple report telling you what Google wants you to cover in your blog post. Whether you have a new site or have been around for a while, Rank IQ will take your Google traffic to a whole new level. Go to rankiq.com slash niche pursuits to lock yourself in at 50% off their monthly rate. I'll put this special link in the episode's description. Welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jared Bauman, and for today's episode, we are joined by Hillary Erickson. Hillary, welcome. Hey, so happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Jared. Yeah, good to have you. So this is your first 
podcast interview. However, you're not new to the Niche Pursuits audience. You um, contributed basically, I guess for lack of a better terms, like a guest post or an article about your success. And it was so well received that we thought, hey, let's make that into a podcast episode. Yeah. I love being here. You guys contacted me, wanted to know more about my story. I'm unique because I've been doing it for so long, I think. So, yep. I was taken aback when I saw when your first site that you're working on, even to this day, was started. I won't bury the lead, though. Why don't you fill us in a little bit on your background, your history, on your websites, and where you're at today? Yeah. So I'm Hillary Erickson. I started my blog. I mean, it was a mommy blog back in the day in 2005 on blogger, of course, where all the cool kids were. Yes. (laughs) And I just really, I've always enjoyed writing. um, But at the time I was a labor and delivery nurse and, but I did not talk about labor and delivery nursing on the website. It was more family. I shared like a lot of deals. We lived in the Bay area. So we were trying to live cheap and you know, I just kept writing it, just enjoying writing it, probably shared too much about my kids. Like I see a lot of people doing now on social media and, you know, I just kept doing it and I always wanted it to be more popular, but I just, you know, I tried Facebook, Facebook didn't really work. Um, but in 2014, Pinterest came on the scene um, and I figured out how to ramp it up using Pinterest and creating articles that were more informative. And I'd always really liked graphic design, but I hadn't really figured out that I could marry the two. And that is ultimately, I think, what ended up being the scaler of my website was really improving my images using more stock photography because I wasn't going to have 400 pictures of me being pregnant on the website So 2014, I really started ramping it up and yeah. And then now I live in Phoenix. I have three kids. My oldest just graduated from college. So he was little in 2005 though. (laughs) And obviously Pinterest has changed a bit, you know, maybe catches up on the last couple of years and just from a high level, any changes you've made in terms of your strategy with, with the website. Yeah. So obviously Pinterest is horrible now, (laughs) but um, (laughs) I didn't want to just say it, but I'm glad you said it. (laughs) It's definitely not the traffic cow that it used to be. So you used to pin 20 to 30 images a day on Pinterest and it would just bring you traffic. As soon as you put a pin on there, you could see a bump in traffic, which was amazing. It is not that anymore. Ultimately, I only see much traffic from older pins. And so um, those just live out there. I maybe repin one popular pin once a week and I do about three new pins a week, three to, I mean, maybe five because I do new posts and stuff like that, but I'm really not like focusing a lot of like new stuff on Pinterest, but old stuff does still continue to bring in traffic, which is awesome. And I am finding, I just dropped to three to three a week. And I was pinning daily from each website. I have two websites, pulling curls. And then I have another one, the pregnancy nurse. And I, and I dropped from seven to three and I've seen an increase in traffic, but who knows if it's just seasonal or if it's really related, we'll just have to see, but yeah, I miss it. I miss old Pinterest. (laughs) Well, I want to talk about some of the Pinterest things um, a bit later on in, in, in the interview today. Um, with Pinterest kind of dying off, like where is your website? Let's talk about, because pullingcurls.com is your main, your main website. And um, it's the one that you discussed in the, um, in the, the uh, blog post. I don't know why I'm blanking on it. <laughs> and we'll reference the blog post in the show notes as well. For this. So if you're listening or you're following along, we'll include that in the show notes. You can listen to the interview and then go back and cross-reference the blog post as well. But pulling curls is what you referenced a lot in the blog post. And maybe bring us up to speed on what, type of website that is today. It's not really a mom blog anymore. I'll, I'll, I'll say that out of the gate. And then maybe just share some basic income, some revenue, just so we can get an idea for the scale of the site and, and traffic and, and where your revenue sources are. Yeah. So Pulling Curls is just there to help simplify family life for families. Each article is written to help simplify something, be it Disneyland or you know, checks at the hospital, IVs at the hospital. Like we write about everything. I know there's sites that are like, oh, we write about everything, but we've gone like pinworms to Disney princesses. Like we really, we really (laughs) hit most pretty much everything. Nothing about men. Okay. We don't write much about men. Fair enough. (laughs) There's not much to write about us. Don't worry. (laughs) So now though, in about 2015, I created my online prenatal class for couples Um, And it's just slowly evolved until that's the big moneymaker for the website. And then I have two other courses that also supplement that income. Um, But I had just noticed that there wasn't 
like an easy way for couples to get a prenatal class in. They had to come to our hospital at Tuesdays at 6 p.m., which I love teaching. I taught prenatal classes for my hospital. But as a mom, it was like the worst time of the day to teach, like to be away from my family. And it was the worst time for them. They were so tired. Half the time, one partner couldn't be there, which was like the worst. So I just thought taking it online wouldn't make sense. So I have that online course. I have a home organization course and I have like a organizing your family course. It's not really parenting because I don't know that I'm a great parent, but I am good at like wrangling them into an organized system. So um, that that website pulling curls really just aims to funnel people into one of those courses and to help people obviously. Um, and then, you know, we have advertising on the website. I don't do so many sponsored posts anymore. I definitely did in the beginning. Um, every now and then I find one that fits well. And so that's what pulling curls is now. And then I made the second website, the pregnancy nurse. So most of my more like scholarly writing, would be on the pregnancy nurse about pregnancy. And, you know, I still do fun articles on pulling curls about pregnancy, but most of the like nitty gritty stuff I kept to the pregnancy nurse, just because I understand that once moms are done being pregnant, they don't want to think about it anymore. (laughs) I have a one-year-old here and I can vouch that my wife would probably not want to think about it for a while too. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of revenue is the, um, what kind of revenue and page views is the, uh, the pulling curls website bringing in at this point? So Pulling Curls gets about 200,000 page views a month. Um, and I, I'm not great at separating out the revenue between the two as far as like affiliate income. Pregnancy Nurse is on Mediavine. It gets less page views than Mediavine requires. But because I was with Mediavine for so long with Pulling Curls and because I've worked with them in a few different ways, they they nudged me in. And so Pulling Curls, between the both of them, we're making, we're making about twelve to $15,000 a month. But, um, you know, back in 2020, when all prenatal classes like died because everyone was taking them at the hospital, we definitely had ginormous months that were super exciting. But since then, there has been a rush of prenatal classes on the Internet and, um, you know, the income has gone down, but it's still great. Still grateful for it. That's great. Yeah, especially if and you were saying, I think you make the more the the lion's share or at least more than 50 percent of your income off the courses right so that's yeah that's what you've really done but 200,000 page views a month is no um that's no small feat so I think you're doing really well (laughs) yeah let me ask Um, you but I have to say like my page views peaked in probably 2015 and either lingered around to you know 300,000 was kind of maybe hit almost close to 400,000 but it's really been angling the page views to sell courses sell affiliate income you know really give people what they need rather than just like yay a page view yeah not all pages are created the same is that what, is no. that what you're saying no they are not yeah um well i have a lot of i've already written half a page of notes here i have a lot of questions but i, <laughs> I, I want to go back to the very beginning and maybe just talk through a big question i have is how you how you transitioned this site from say 2005 blogger mom blog i mean you know that's obviously a kind of a ubiquitous phrase that people use and we kind of get an idea for that but into this very very focused site about helping parents and very you know directionally focused on course sales like how did you walk through that process was it uh, something where you lingered on it for a while and then overnight made this decision or did you did you slowly evolve into it having certain things that that gave you the impetus to do that you know Yeah. So I read the famous Ruth Soka book and it was something like blogging without selling your soul, something along those lines that a lot of us read back in like 2014. And she just showed us how to use Pinterest. And, um, you know, I quickly realized that if somebody was going to pick on a pick, click on a pin on Pinterest, there had to be like something they were gaining from that article. So every article needed a reason that somebody is going to click on it, you know, And I see a lot of people who are just like, people want to see pretty pictures or like what's happening with my family. No one wants to see that on Pinterest. That's what the blog was in 2005. You know, it was a little bit of like, here's how to get great deals on fruit snacks. But, um, you know, I really needed to angle articles like how to stop throwing up. I took a lot of my nursing knowledge and wrote articles about it because I used to work phone triage for a pediatrician. So I thought all of those things that I had learned, I turned into articles so that they could really help people. And then those just did really well on Pinterest. So it was really just why, why does a reader want to come to my site? They don't want to see me or my kids. They want information and that's what I can give. And I was actually really good at that. I just um, hadn't really funneled it into how it could make a website. How it could make a website. Yeah. 
We had uh, a guest on a couple months ago, Emily Dyson, and she talked about how her site was built entirely really on, on, on Pinterest traffic and then nosedived. And then she went through a process over the course of a year or so of building that traffic back up via optimizing for search. And her story was, was pretty dramatic in terms of the drop off and then the scale she, she went back on. How did you start to identify that Pinterest wasn't working anymore and then transition away from Pinterest as your, as your primary traffic driver? I mean, I still want to pump Pinterest for absolutely everything Pinterest will give me. So I definitely still write posts that are Pinterest, like mistakes you might make in the labor room. Like those type of articles tend to do well on Pinterest. And so I still write those every once in a while. Plus, I think they're fun to write. I think they're more personable. And if people find those articles after finding an article on induction, they tend to find that I'm more human and that I have more information to give. But I started using Rank IQ um, to build my SEO on the website. Although I have to say, pulling curls is hard. It because it writes about everything, Google is like, who are you? What are you about? You're very confusing to me. And so it has been a slower go on um, SEO, but updating older posts using Rank IQ has really helped. So posts that they already think that I am an expert on, when I update it and add all those words from Rank IQ, I've seen good benefits from that overall. So that's interesting to hear you say that. I want to ask you about kind of this topic of like topical authority and writing about a bunch of different subjects, but I'll save that for a little bit later because <laughs> I want to stay on this. Um, uh, but I'm really curious to hear your opinions on that. The the, the topic of, of Pinterest and, and kind of, you know, what you're doing now with Pinterest, is there, for people listening who missed the 2014 boat on Pinterest, like the ship sailed on 2014 Pinterest, the ship is is, is out to sea and gone, but is there value in someone who has a website right now and has content that actually could serve a Pinterest community well? Like, is there value in them actually even bothering to try right now? Or is it more just because you're already in it, you already have a good process and you already have this aged account with Pinterest that it, that it might still be working? It It is a rough go because I have a second site. So I made a pregnancy entirely um, Pinterest and I am even pinning it from this larger Pinterest account. Um, you know, so I do have juice that I can give it. But um, it is failing to thrive if it was a baby. <laughs> I don't know. You know, if I was like learning how to make pins and learning how to pin and I didn't already have a Pinterest scheduler, then I think it would be really overwhelming and maybe may make me want to not do it. Um, that being said, when I go to a website and I read a really good article and they don't have a pinnable image, I'm like, that is a loss of something I could have shared because a lot of times I'll be like, Oh, I want to pin that. A lot of times people feature me in an article and I'll be like, dang, I'll pin that for you because Pinterest is probably the best juice that I can give somebody. Um, and then if they don't have a pinnable image, I'm like, well, shoot, I don't know what to do for you. So I do think everyone should be making like a 600 by 900 image for every post so that people can, and they should have a social share button that people can pin it because I think pins directly from an article really Pinterest is like, Ooh, that's like organic. That's very exciting. It gets excited by that. I think versus like just, you know, scrolling on the Pinterest page and repinning other people's stuff. So I think everybody should have a Pinterest account and be doing it. Should you be making 10 new pins a day? No, I don't think you're going to get a whole lot of return on that type of investment unless you're a foodie. <laughs> Those foodies Unless, still do really well, mm -hmm. but that's a whole other bag of chips. Yeah. Yeah. Well, bag of chip. Well played. You, you've got some. Good <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I ask people who talk about Pinterest, I ask them like, is it worth it right now? And the general sentiment does seem to be that, you know, we're recording in 2022 and it's a rough go. It's a rough go. So. Um, I think Pinterest just needs to realize that it is the female. I know I'm gendering this out search engine. Women love to look see the picture, scroll that way. If they could just be like, yep, that's what we are. We are the visual search engine. We're going to throw some ads in there um, and keep being this visual search engine. They could totally make a go of it, but they're like, let's be TikTok and Instagram and a visual search engine. And that's just, I was going to ask you, it. is there, it, Pinterest certainly like came on the back for marketers of Facebook, right? Like Facebook had all this great organic reach. You didn't have to pay for that reach. They introduced boosting and all of a sudden over time like the algorithm started to favor um uh, more paid traffic and so you'd have to pay to play on facebook a lot of people pivoted to pinterest pinterest was a great place to get lots of organic traffic that replaced 
Facebook. Now, Pinterest has kind of gone the way of the Facebooks and the Instagrams of the world. Is there anything you're looking into for what's next, for what might be driving future traffic to your site from a social media standpoint? I mean, I'm on TikTok, pregnancy okay. related, entirely pregnancy. Um, and it does drive more traffic than Instagram. I think like when you go viral on TikTok, those people click on your link. Um, and so that's exciting, but it's just not the same as Pinterest where, you know, they, you know, that they were looking to stop throwing up, they click through, you, you know, that they're coming for you. Whereas TikTok, not exactly sure how people found me, you know, if they just hate me because I'm not a doula and that's why they're clicking through, you know, it's just a really varied, um, hard to say why they're clicking through, but I'll take them. I'll take them. Fair enough. Okay. Well, let's talk about that you tease this concept of topical authority. Your site is, um, you know, is I'll say like uh, pulling curls to cover so many different topics from, what'd you say from Disneyland to, I don't remember the pinworms. reference. Pinworms. Yeah, pinworms. pinworms. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great reference. Again, you, you've got some good, uh, you've got some little good acronyms there, quips or whatever you want to call them. But so your site covers so many different things. Have you ever seen that to be an issue as it relates to topical authority? Like talk, talk about, how you go about coming up with topics that maybe align with what Google is looking for. I'm using air quotes for these list, those of you listening on the, on the podcast uh, audio. Yeah. So I think you do have to like bridge it in Google's mind. So I had some pregnancy stuff that was ranking and then I decided to write about pregnancy at Disneyland. Right. So I built the bridge to Disneyland. So I rank for pregnancy at Disneyland. Then maybe can I rank for what to eat at Disneyland or what backpack to take at Disneyland? You know, can you build that bridge on something that you're already doing to the other land? I think it's sometimes possible, but it is harder. I will say now that I have this fully niche site, it does seem easier to be like, that girl is pregnancy, 100%. We love that. She knows what she's doing. And I do put in every single article, Hillary Erickson is an RMBSN and has 20 years of labor and delivery experience so that, you know, it shows that I have that. Now I put that on most pregnancy articles on pulling curls, the new ones, I definitely put it on. It's not on all the old ones, you know, but I can't say that about Disneyland, although I have been going to Disneyland for longer than 20 years, but yeah. you know, it's hard to be like, I am a Disney. I'm sure somebody out there has some sort of Disney certification program, but I do not have that, nor do I want that. So I just think it's harder to show that I'm an expert on all these different things, even though I obviously am. So dang you, Google. <laughs> um, yeah, clearly, I don't know. On. I think I think it's important to have like an author box that, sh or you know, an about me page, or mention your expertise as much as you can in these articles, and to also write on the same top really topics, you know, really frequently. Um, but other than that, that's really all you can do. I, I mean, I would never tell someone to write a pulling curls website at this point in time. Yeah. It's too general. It's too vague. Um, ultimately pulling curls is the brand that branches out into different areas. Um, I just call it like a media empire at this point. That being said, I love that my, I can write about pinworms one day and I can write about Disneyland the next day. And I can write about like how to communicate with your doctor the next day, because I love to write about lots of different things. And I think it's prevented me from having any burnout because I'll just be like, I, I can't do, um, you know, I can't do beta strep today, but I can do, you know, where to watch the parade at Disneyland. So how far have you gone? Let's, let's use a Disneyland analogy, maybe if that makes sense. Like, I love your example of, um, being pregnant. Like that's kind of the, maybe the basis of pulling curls, or at least the foundation of where a lot of topics start because you know, you're a, a labor and delivery nurse and you have that background and then pregnancy at Disneyland is the bridge to Disneyland. Like how many topics have you written about and maybe are actually ranking for as it relates to just kind of some of the more tertiary or secondary Disneyland topics? I mean, I rank for a good number. The other thing is I used to rank for family budget. Well, I still rank for family budget, um, like certain keywords. I can't even remember. But because I ranked for that, I could write about Disneyland budget, right? So you try and take what you want to write about. Like Disneyland budget, Disneyland blogging is like my hobby. And I just enjoy writing those articles. I think they're fun. Um, and I would love for them to rank on Google. So I take what I... Google thinks I rank about, and you can tell that in the Google search console, Google thinks you're an authority on these things that are ranking, right? And they're getting traffic and they're ranked well. 
And then how could I pivot that into an article that I would think would be really fun to write about? Mm -hmm. Then you try and find, you know, the low volume keywords, you use Rank IQ, put all those together. Hopefully you can get an article that ranks. And sometimes, you know, it is a gamble. Sometimes they rank. And sometimes I'm like, that is an amazing article. I am clearly an expert and I am not. Google does not think that I am. So <laughs> Google does not think that you are. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's worth mentioning. I, I don't know this, but I run a marketing, like an SEO marketing agency for my day job. And I will say that we've seen it's a lot easier to work with sites as it relates to topical authority that are older, you know, and your site has been around for going on 20 years now, you know, so as it relates to Google trusting topics that get put out there, like to some degree, you've been semi-routinely blogging and writing for almost 20 years since 2005 on this website. I wonder, you know, who knows how much of an impact that might also have compared to somebody who might want to try that same approach on a website they started six months ago. Yeah, I definitely have a higher domain authority on pulling curls than I do on the pregnancy nurse. But I think still for pregnancy, Google is like, that girl knows pregnancy, this pulling curls girl, she's crazy. But you're the same person. <laughs> Google doesn't seem to care. Yeah, well, Google has their ways, do they not? <laughs> Let's, um, before we get into kind of your courses and, and how you've built that out, because uh, I really want to ask you about, about that sort of thing. Um, you, you mentioned that you, you used to do some sponsored posts and you don't do as much of it now. Um, talk about uh, how sponsored posts worked for you previously. Uh, maybe a little bit about, you know, how you got those sponsored posts and then why you don't do it as much now. Uh, I'd love to hear some more on that. I mean, I 100% did post for free product back in the, I mean, I started advertising on blog her probably in 2007, I would guess. Um, and they would send sponsored posts every once in a while, or maybe we'd get like $35 and the free product to post. And we were like, yeah, totally. You know, because I was hundred percent a nurse at this point in time. And so I would write those different kinds of things. And then it just, you know, expanded. Like, no, I wouldn't write a post for 35. The, the money went to 500, right? Because I'm good at writing articles. I got a lot of traffic. Um, and at that point in time, I knew that an article on Pinterest would, you know, get a certain number of views. It would get a decent amount of views. Um, but ultimately now I'm, I probably have priced myself out of the market because write a post you know, you've got to think that this is a writer who has 20 years of writing website posts experience, um, who has a certain amount of a theory, um, you know, and clout behind her in order for me to write that post, it is going to be, and especially if it is for a drug maker, because I am an RN, I get a lot of like, come write about this pregnancy test or whatever, you know, that's going to be like $5,000 because I know you're going to come back with stupid, um, edits that you want me to write about certain, certain things. You know, and I'm very clear that I am the last word in the post when I do a sponsored post. And so ultimately, I just think I'm probably more expensive. And I don't know that people would even get the return out of me writing the article. Mm. But in order for me to get the, the amount of time it takes me to write an article and to give away just a little bit of my clout to those people, that's what it costs. So yep. I love how you you conveniently just dropped in. You went from thirty five dollars to five hundred dollars. <laughs> I was expecting you to say like $75 or $100. <laughs> I don't even remember. It was so long ago, but I remember yeah. when I finally was like 500, I will not go below 500. And now I'm just like, I mean, there probably are people that would pay the $5,000 for me to have a do, but I'm just like, no, you are not my people. So yeah. it doesn't, because I need to save all of that. I love Hillary so much for courses. I don't need to give it to, um, here's your preterm labor test, right? Yeah, that's interesting. You talk about how you're thinking about the viewer or the people that access your site and then what the what the site's kind of primary focus is now. Which yeah. is courses. Yeah. Well, let's talk about courses. So when did you uh take us back to when you first decided to launch a course? Uh, how you picked the topic, how you vetted it, and then how you put it together. So, I mean, it was a prenatal class. I had already taught prenatal classes for my hospital. I had already written like some mini prenatal class content for my blog. And I just thought this makes a lot of sense to write a book about it. I think I may have written a book before that book, but I'm not even sure. So, um, but ultimately it started out as the book because they're really, I mean, this was way back in the day. There was not like, there was no teachable, maybe there was teachable, but 
it was like astronomically priced for me because it was really important that I, you know, make as much money as possible. Um, and so I started with a book and then as soon as the book was done, I was kind of looking with how I was going to transition it to a course on my website. And so I initially used a plugin called lifter LMS, mm -hmm. had it on my website, did not use a subdomain because I was my tech support at the time, which was a big mistake. And then anything I changed on the course would mess up stuff. I changed on the blog, blog stuff would mess up the course. And so it ultimately was just a tech nightmare. So then I moved to teachable in probably late 2015, maybe 2016. Um, and I did see a jump in sales. I think people just felt like it was a little more legit, um, mm -hmm. you know, looked more polished and maybe because I was investing that thousand dollars into teachable, I took it a little bit more seriously and made it a little bit more polished. Um, and then I've been on teachable since then, although my plan is this fall when my teachable contract is to move is up like how much I paid, um, I'm going to move to learn with Thrivecart just because it's a one-time payment and I will be able to host it and have a little bit more control over the things. Um, and I do love a one-time payment. <laughs> hey, I, you've clearly proven the model out. So, you know, even a higher one-time payment for you would probably pay itself off in dividends quickly. Yeah. Um, so what's the, what's the, the makeup, let's say of your kind of your flagship, your prenatal course, like how long is it? How do you break it up? Um, uh, how much is it priced? Just, you know, just trying to get my mind around exactly what it looks like. Yeah. So it is, I always say it can be done in three hours, but that would literally be like sitting down watching every single video, not looking at anything else. But I think a lot of people don't want a prenatal class that takes 12 hours. Like nobody's like, yes, that sounds fun. I just want to sit there and absorb. I mean, I think a lot of pregnant people think of it that way that they want to sit down and, and absorb, but I don't think partners do. So because my class is aimed for couples, I wanted to make it that they could sit down and cruise through it. And in fact, if partners even want even less than the three hours, they can do just the key point videos, which is like the cliff notes version of each chapter mm -hmm. You're and just enjoy life. that. Yeah. So um, it is, it has three hours of video content. It's probably just a little bit more than that at this point. Cause I added one more, um, video on my most recent update and then it has, uh, all the text. So if you're a reader, you can get it that way. Um, it has the key points. It has a quiz that goes through the key points. Cause I always love those kind of things just to make sure that you're like actually getting it. Um, and because it's for couples, each, um, section has questions for the couples. So let's say, it's about hospital admission. Like the chapter is about that. And I'm going to say, you guys need to discuss who you're planning on coming to the hospital. Now this mattered more before COVID, although it's coming back into play, but a lot of times the partner thinks, yeah, my mom's coming to the hospital. If your mom's coming to the hospital and the pregnant person is like, your mom is not coming to the hospital. She's not even welcome. I don't even want to see her while I'm there and just getting those things out of the way. So um, all of us listening kind of to have the... kids or all of us listening to have kids are just chuckling right now to ourselves. <laughs> right. <laughs> <all> <laughs> or or where is the baby going to sleep? Because a lot of times the pregnant person is like, it's going to sleep in the bed with me, right? Which I don't, I'm not a co-sleeper, but a lot of times that's what they're thinking. And the partner is like, there's no way the baby is going to be in our bed. Like they're envisioning a two-year-old stuck between them and what that would entail, right? And so just discussing these things ahead of time, I thought was really important. And I've, I kind of was like, this is kind of stupid when I put it in. But it has actually been one of the things that in my reviews, people are like, I loved the couple's questions. Um, and they're probably stupid for me because my kid oldest is graduating from college, right? Like to me, this is this is baby stuff because it is baby stuff. Um, and then I have some bonus videos on like natural pain management, talking with your doctor, like how to do newborn stuff, like how to change a diaper, how to take a temperature, all those different kinds of things. Um, and so that's what the class is. I try and give it you know, in as many different ways that people consume it as possible. Um, and you can actually buy it at three different price points. So I still have the book because the book is like $35. I want everyone to be able to get this information. So if you are a reader, you can buy the book. Okay. Then there is a $99 one that you can get just the videos and all that kind of information. And then if you want uh, more interaction, more, more of me, you can get the deluxe version that has the Facebook group. It has printable labor movement cards. It has the printable book or the downloadable book. I'm hoping no one is printing out the book because that would take a lot of paper. It has live Q and A's with me. It has replays of the old Q and A's with me. So if you just want everything, you can get that. And that one is 200, but you know, ultimately this goal is to try and 
educate as many pregnant people as possible and pregnant families. And so it's really important for me to keep the price point low, but then offer, you know, a higher end version if people want more of me, because that's what takes the time is me. Because once the course is made, it's made, it just runs in there. Um, you know, I update it and all that kind of stuff, but it's not the same as like me being in a live Q and a or answering your question on Facebook. I'm curious because you kind of settled on a, a little bit of a, of a focus with the course, right? It sounds like it's prenatal, but for couples, uh, how important has that focus been, or is it more just accidental the way that your course turned out that way? Because they talk about in marketing, right? Like kind of niche down a little bit, have a specialty, have a focus, have something that makes your product unique. Heard you talk about not only who it's for, but just the feedback and the reviews. Like, it sounds like this couple focus has been somewhat important for you. Yes. And completely, I think like, uh, I just fell into it. Like I was like, how is mine going to be different? But honestly, when my course was made, I was the only one doing a hospital course. Everyone else's was, uh, laboring at home, like natural birthing at home, which I am like the antithesis of, like, I don't know anything about it. I don't know how to help you. You make me nervous because of all my experience. And so, um, but I just thought, you know, how could I be different? And I just felt like, I feel like families is so important. And I think educating the dad can be so important so that they feel less nervous and more tied into the pregnancy. So that hopefully when the baby comes out, they feel more tied into that baby and they can just start off easier just because I found that to be so important in my own life. But ultimately, I I don't know that I put that much thought into it when I actually started it. I just wish just I'd known about your course when we were <laughs> having our first, I, all the stories you have are, are so similar. Like my wife and I were trying to find time to go in the evenings to like, what is it every six weeks or, you know, it's like six weeks, you know, one night a week and we just couldn't. So we had to take the whole Saturday course. Oh, it's a, it's a and it was, it was Valentine's day, actually. Not that, <laughs> you know, that's a big deal, but, um, but it was Valentine's day. And I, by like hour six, I'm just like glossed over. I can't even comprehend what we're talking about anymore. Cause there's just so much information coming right at you. So, you know, it would have been great to have a course to kind of do at your own pace in the evenings when you have a free night. So I think it's great. Um, yeah, I think people love the bites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can just like, okay, now I understand C-sections and it doesn't have to take over my life tonight, right? Like yeah. we're moving on now. We're moving on. Um, talk about the production value and like how you produce the course. Is it really high production value? Did you kind of get a video team or, or on the flip side, did you get an iPhone out and just kind of roll with it? Like, and again, I'm just trying to think of people who have an expertise, maybe even have a platform, haven't done a course and they're thinking, Oh, but it sounds like so much work. I know nothing about the production side of things. Yes, it can be really daunting. So I think that the most important part for a course is the audio right? because um, people are listening to you. So making sure that you have, you are mic'd well, I think is so important. Um, the video is handy. Um, and in my video, I actually um, invested in a program. I think I use WeVideo for that course where I can add a lot of stock images. So they even had hospital ones, you know, um, where I could show them drawing blood. I could show them putting in an IV. I could show the OR, you know, I could add images so that if I wasn't looking so great on camera, which happens, you know, or we needed to cut it that I could just throw stock images over it and cover it up. So I am the video team. Yep. Well, my husband is too. So we just set it up on a tripod. We have a ring light. And we just recorded it. Now we recorded it in my kind of like off of a bookshelf so that we were just trying to like have as neutral of background as possible. Um, and now I have like a YouTube set. I mean, the set, but it's just nice to have a place set up if you have a family that doesn't like have laundry in the background because <laughs> that's easy to have laundry in the background. So I, uh, I filmed it all myself. I, I actually have my son who just graduated from high school, but if we're thinking six years or high, he would do, he will do a rough edit of the prenatal class. So he takes out the ums, he takes up the back it up Spencer, he takes out um, those kind of things and then sends it to me. And then I do the final edit. I add titles and that kind of stuff. But um, he has always been hired as my video editor and he actually has his own YouTube channel now and is monetized, whereas I am not monetized. So that's an area of concern, but <laughs> full family yeah, affair. It's, it's been us. Yeah. And I think in order to keep it reasonably priced, um, which I think going forward, people are maybe going to value their dollar a little bit more and they probably don't need 
I mean, I've looked around at studios because I was thinking about filming my um, newborn section again. And I called around and it was just like astronomical prices just to rent a studio. So I actually had a friend who had an empty room in her house. And so we filmed it there, which was like a table and stuff like that. So I think there are places that you can find um, to make it reasonable. And the one thing I always tell people with courses is you can always update them. Like mm -hmm. this course was like not as good as it is now in the beginning. Um, and if I find that people aren't loving a certain section, although I haven't really found that, or I, you know, I'll go through it. I'll be like, oh, why didn't I add this part? And so I can just go in and add it real easily. A lot of times in we video, I'll just do a voiceover and add a little section. Um, it, you can always update them. That's the beauty of courses because you just like upload a new video file and boom, it's there. What are you using specifically for capturing, for editing, for recording? Just, you know, what, what kind of, what, what software are you using? Yeah. So I did invest in a good video camera. I have a Canon 80D. Um, and then I have an external mic. I have a, a Rode um, clip-on microphone that I use to when I'm filming those sorts, sorts of things. I found that that's important because I used to have a wired one, but one time I almost like I pulled it out of the camera and it didn't capture any audio. So the the mic, I think it's Bluetooth. I don't even know what it is, but it connects to the camera somehow by the magic of audio. I don't know. Um, also, my husband does help with a lot of that. He is a former band director. He now teaches like junior or community college, but because he's so into audio, he does help the audio, which I think is so important. And we actually have a podcast. So audio is pretty important. He edits the podcast and those different kind of things. So it's def, it is a family affair. And my daughter does the, um, transcriptions of the podcast and oh, perfect captioning you have everyone, you have everyone involved <laughs> well you know once you make a certain amount of money you're looking for the write-offs and kids is definitely a great way to do it um and we would like pay them half and the other half goes into their 529 so but during covid those kids were rich because they didn't have anywhere to spend it <laughs> and plenty of time to work Yes, they were all working for me. We were updating stuff. And I was like, you have more in your accounts than I do. Yeah. So you, uh, at some point, launched a couple of additional courses. You talked about a home organization course. You talked about a family organization course. Um, how did those evolve? Are, are, and I'm curious, are they, are, are they kind of a, I don't want to call it an upsell process, but at some point when you get people in the, the flagship course, the prenatal course, do you come back to them and offer them the, the home organization or the family organization course. I'm just curious how these, how these all developed. So, I mean, I just love organizing and people have like, like friends have just like brought me in to help them organize different things. And I love like thinking like, how could I make a system easier for my family to make it work? And so I just thought a home organization class would be fun to make. And I basically have three pillars of my website. I know we've talked a lot about Disney, but ultimately the website is organization, family, and pregnancy. And so I was like, I feel like we're leaving money on the table or we're not helping as many people as possible. So that's why I created the family routines. Mm -hmm. I have had some people who have bought the prenatal class and then come back and buy the organized home. But, you know, nobody like right after they have a baby is like, oh, let's get organized. They're just like, <laughs> my life is falling apart. So after they have their baby, I do transition them into my parenting series, um, you know, and, you know, all along that way, I do offer the course. And I think people who take the prenatal class end up really liking me. And so they want to stick with me, but I don't know. It's, they are completely separate beasts. Like I never am like, well, I'll sell them a prenatal class and then I'll sell them a whole organization right. class. And then I'll organize those toddlers. Like, no, that's not what they're, I, I didn't do it right, but they're fun. And they're the ones that I enjoy. And because I enjoy them, I think they sell all right. But the prenatal class does sell the most, um, followed by the organization and then the family. I think it's, I think it's hard to sell to moms. The more, you know, people are like, oh, I'm going to make a mom course. I'm like, good luck. Moms have a lot. They have a lot to figure out how to get into their budget. And constantly they're like, well, do I need this course? Or does Johnny need new shoes? Shoes are always going to win out. So, yeah. Mm, that's a very interesting point. That's an interesting point. Well, um, you know, we, we glossed over, but I, I'm going backwards now, but I'm actually walking through in my mind how you're selling these courses to your audience and that sort of thing where is uh the primary sources of traffic to your website you talked about how it's 
around 200,000 page views a month. And obviously we've gone through Pinterest and where it's at. Where What drives most of the traffic right now? Um, Pinterest and Google are driving mm-hmm. most of the traffic. Um, I think Pinterest is still a little bit higher than Google. Um, on the second site, the pregnancy nurse, it is mostly Google. Pinterest is, um, I don't know if it's even third. TikTok might even be before Pinterest, sadly. So, and so that's where they're coming in from. Yeah. So when it comes to how you're selling the course to the audience and the people that come to your website, are you selling it straight from the articles themselves? Or are you moving people onto an email list and then selling it through like an autoresponder sequence? How are the bulk of people buying the courses that you have? Yeah. So I will, I will let them buy in any way that they want to. I definitely direct pitch the course in every post, but I also have, you know, email opt-ins. Every course has a, like a mini course that people can take before they take the big course. Um, I have a free beginning prenatal class. I have a five word organization challenge, and I have a, a practical parenting series that has like five of my best mediocre pregnancy or parenting tips. So, you know, they can do any of those, but I do offer other ways to get on the email list. Cause I'm not sure that everyone is up for like courses immediately. And so, um, you know, I have a free hospital packing list. I have quizzes that do pretty well also surprisingly. Um, and so, you know, I just, every single post, I either want to sell them something, get them to buy a course or to just make them love me more, realize that I respect me as an, an authority in this area. Right. But I do have people who directly buy from TikTok or Instagram or the podcast. Like I have, I am hitting every every person wherever they could be. So, um, and hopefully ultimately it leads to course sales. Like that is, that is what everything is designed to do and to help people. It just sounds like I'm just like a greedy, uh, the monopoly guy over here, just like trying to make all the money. But I am definitely, that's part of why I'm on TikTok is I think there's a lot of young moms who probably can't even afford the $35 prenatal class who are out there that I'm giving good information that will help them have a better birth in addition to, um, you know, having some fun on TikTok, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, this is a, uh, this is like a marketing and, and, and business podcast. So it's okay. You can talk about the, the business goals <laughs> of the website. Um, but we haven't touched on the email list. Like, you know, how's, uh, how, how, how are you working with email? How are you, uh, you know, how's your email list built out? If you don't mind sharing like some rough numbers and maybe how many, you know, do you have autoresponder sequences or do you just kind of pop in and send out a blast style email once in a while? What are you doing with email? Cause it sounds like it is a, a factor. You've got a lot of freebies and, and, and offers that drive people to email. So how are you using email to sell courses? Yes, I am deeply in bed with my email program. In fact, I started like pretty soon after ConvertKit came out, like, and everyone was talking about segmenting and all that kind of thing. Um, and I have, I think it's like a hundred different autoresponders. Oh my. Okay. You're, <laughs> yeah, you're definitely in on email. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's not, maybe it's like 80, but it is a good number of autoresponders. Now, some of them are just like one and done, like, um, you know, like if you want to know about Bosch mixers, like I might just send you like five emails about like how I use my Bosch mixer. Like some of my best affiliate programs, a lot of times I will have um, a short autoresponder on. Um, but yes, when you have a website that's about everything, I knew that if I wanted to do an email thing, it had to be heavily mm-hmm. segmented mm-hmm. because I couldn't, you know, send me the 45 year old mom. 46, darn it. Um, a pregnancy information like that would be an immediate turnoff to me. Right. Because I don't care about that at all. And if that's what this person is going to send me, I'm not interested. So I knew that if I'm interested in organization, I should only pretty much be getting organization stuff. Right. And if I'm interested in pregnancy, I'm pretty much just getting pregnancy content. Now I do send out like a monthly newsletter where, you know, there's plenty of pregnant women who are interested in organizing as well because nesting. Um, and so they can in that like share like my most popular posts lately. And I have a little button that they can click that says, if you're interested in more organization stuff, click here and I can help you with that as well. So they can like, they can traverse amongst the Hillary newsletter system, but in general, they remain in very segmented pots, um, where they only get information about, you know, those few things. Yeah. Um, and there is a lot, it is, it is a lot. I actually left ConvertKit because I had their, the forms on my site from them just started dying. And I, and I had been with them for so long. I texted or I, you know, talked to them, their customer service. And they were just like, yeah, well, we changed our forms. So you're just going to have to go in and like 
change them on your site. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. I've been with you for so long. It's so, it's really pricey. I'm not even sure that convert kit is worth it because I, I don't know how many people actually are converting on a newsletter. Um, I wish it was higher. Like I'm constantly tweaking how I'm emailing people, what I'm emailing people, but I will say more people buy cold off the site than buy through my newsletter. Mm, okay. So I am actually with BirdSend, which is uh, maybe a quarter of the price of ConvertKit and does all the same things. It just doesn't have like the ConvertKit name around it. Um, so yeah, but everything has an autoresponder. Um, and I do usually send out like about a new podcast. I'll send it to those people that are opted in for that. Sometimes if I write a new post that I think will be really helpful, I'll send that out. I don't send out like every single new post but some of the new ones I'll send out, but usually everyone's getting an, an email from their bucket at least once a week. And then I should say that when they join, they're usually getting about five emails daily just to be like, Hey, I'm Hillary. You love me. Right. Just to show, remember why they signed up and who I am and kind of what I have to offer. Is that something that you, you spend a bulk of time setting up, you know, out of the gate when you were, when you, when you decided to go uh, all in on an email, or have you kind of built these up over time? Um, when I decided to build a pregnancy newsletter, I it was like a full week of like, I don't know, 12 hour days just creating because I initially did like nine separate pregnancy newsletters so they could sign up for whatever month they were in. And then it was, it was a lot. I have since then simplified because I found that that wasn't as helpful as I wanted it to be. Um, and so now they sign up for what trimester they're in, but um, every week I'm in there trying, just adjusting, seeing what I can do to fix, adding new content that I have to that newsletter chain, stuff like that. Do, um, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, yes or no. Do you think people who don't have, uh, any sort of email list and any sort of email autoresponder sequence, do you think they should for yes. their website? You do. Okay. And Absolute yes. What's the best immediate way? yes? <laughs> okay, I was sensing maybe you were like a little overwhelmed by I don't know how many I convert there, but it, it sounds like there's so many other benefits you get from it, along with some conversions that it's it's more than worth it for you. Yes, those are the people that absolutely love me. I'm not saying that every single person on my newsletter are those people, but the ones who would follow me anywhere, would do anything, would promote anything, are on that newsletter list. And should I lose my Instagram, my TikTok, like? I would be pretty hard to lose my website, but if I lost all of those things, I could still, if I, I don't know if the internet goes down, we're just all screwed, but, um, I can right. still email those people and be like, this is where I am. And they'll be like, I'm so glad I found I'm back with you, Hillary. You are my people, you know? And so it's the one thing you own, right? I mean, I own my website. Mm -hmm. I own my podcast. I think it's so important to think about who actually owns this, right? Because I do own my podcast. Right. I own my website. Those aren't things people can take away from me. Um, and newsletter is definitely one of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so many people have all of their chips on Instagram or TikTok or right. Facebook. And I've seen so many creators because I've been doing this for so long. Get that taken away. Goodbye. Yeah, and there's so no way to like contact those people either. If you don't have an email list, you can't even say, go to the real Hillary Erickson and that's where you can find me, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's almost even with all the benefits that you can experience today, you're talking about the future proving some of these platforms that have, well, proven to be very unstable for people, unfortunately. Yeah. That's a great point. That's a great point. Where, where, where would you recommend someone who doesn't have an email list or autoresponder sequence set up? Like, where would you recommend they begin? You kind of touched on like, Maybe you wouldn't spend 12 hour days for a full week setting everything up out of the gate. Um, you know, what's like a good small micro goal that people can have that would still help them get started. So I always recommend that people start their first thousand. They're just sending out like a monthly newsletter. Cause at that point it may not be worth your time to create an autoresponder. It could be like, if that's really what you want to do, but at that point in the game, usually you're trying to just get up content, um, you know, and then once you have those first 50 to hundred posts on your site, then you could start thinking about creating that autoresponder that could send them to those best posts that you have, um, which can be really easy to write. But I always say, get up that newsletter thing because people who really like you will even look for it. Like now mine is just like 
get my hospital packing list, come to my pregnancy series, like get a birth plan. Like I'm peppering it in through a post, but even if you just have one that is like, love what you see here, like come, come join me on my newsletter, even though that's completely lame and most people will not sign up for it. At least it's something. Um, and then you can up your game as you get further and further into it, but definitely have the email list, start building it. I think, um, MailChimp still gives you your first thousand for free, which can make it feel less daunting. And usually MailChimp just like integrates with everything. And it's not that hard to transport your newsletter list to a different company. If you decide you want to leave, um, MailChimp or, or whoever you want to go with. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Maybe even skip the autoresponder sequence at first and just start sending out your best content. And then once you get a little bit of traction, start building out maybe a, a, a five email sequence or something like that. Yep. Yeah. Well, as we kind of bring it to a close here, I mean, this has been really fun. I, we've, we've touched on so many topics. I mean, I'm looking back over, obviously there's such a great opportunity for everybody listening. And, and we touch on this every you know couple episodes or whatever we have guests on that talk about how much more you can do with your traffic than just throw up ads put up affiliate offers. Um, and so it's been really great. I think the bulk of it for me that I took away was really how great you've done with course sales and how great you've done with really applying your expertise to courses. I mean, obviously you have an advantage that you are a labor and delivery nurse. I didn't ask, are you still doing that? Or did you transition out of doing that at, at some point in time along that journey? No, once I hit just about 20 years, I was like, and that's enough. And COVID, okay. I was mid COVID and hospitals are not a really fun place to be at. I can imagine. Yeah. We have some <laughs> nurses in the family who, who, who kind of echoed the same thing. So, okay. So you're full time at this. So really we've gotten to let's listen to like a 20 year journey. That's, that's really brought you full circle into where you're full time at this. So that's great. Um, but just also your thoughts on topical authority. Uh, we talked about Pinterest. We talked about, um, about, uh, about how you're uh, structuring email lists, uh, sponsored posts, uh, and probably a bunch of other things that I'm not even mentioning, but um, yeah, anything that we anything we didn't cover that you think is really important uh, to mention for for people listening as we close out. Um, two things. So first off, like when I went into TikTok, I know I've talked about it before, but I felt like I needed to be like the dancing pregnancy nurse, which I am not like I'm fun, but I'm just not <laughs> that kind of fun. And I made it my own. I talked to the camera, just like I do in my courses. People know exactly what they're getting from a course. Cause that's who I am on TikTok, and just doing it consistently showing up every day, you know, being that person on TikTok, and then reusing it on every single platform. So I film on TikTok but I put it on reels. I put it up to YouTube. Sometimes I make a pin, a pin, to pin idea, idea pin. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can reuse that content that took you like 30 seconds to create in so many different places. And I wish I'd been doing that from the very beginning. Cause it really has helped my YouTube channel, at least in subscribers. Um, but either way, I'm still getting my message out there and every once in a while, some, you know, one will do really, really well. So, um, be you and have fun with the different platforms because social media, people can tell if you're not having fun, um, you know, and be you. So those are the things that I would say on that. And the other thing is a lot of people are like, well, how did you do it? How, how have you built this thing? And I'm like, well, first off, I started in 2005 and we're, thousand, <laughs> we're 17 years later and it's just showing up you know, writing the articles, hoping that you're writing it right, writing the articles that you would want to find if you were looking for it. And then being like, I hope it works. And then showing up the next day. And even if whatever I did yesterday or two months ago didn't work, I'm trying it again. Um, just constantly, you know, it is a job. I wake up at 5am, I go to work, I get kids out the door, I throw in laundry, I go back to work, you know, I work out, I go back to work and then kids come home and I answer emails because that's something I can do really easily alone. But it is a job for me. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. are like, oh, you're just like going to Disneyland every week. And I do go to Disneyland, but I, it, it is a job. And if you're not going to treat it like a job, it probably is not going to give you the long-term income that you're looking for. It's inspiring to hear you talk about it because I mean, I think we can say for certain that when you started in 2005, your website it had, I don't want to say no direction, but it didn't have the direction that we now look back on and think, oh man, I need to be thinking about the courses I'm going to create this, the, you know, the topics I'm going to write about all that. And it's just a wonderful story for someone who showed up every day and learned as they went and just kept pivoting into the things that were working and away from the things that weren't working. Yeah. 
and pivoting toward what I found was fun mm. because a lot of times I'm just like, this isn't fun anymore. And I'll either hire it out if it's absolutely necessary, like responding comments on my website. I have hired it out because I don't need to be offended by every comment that I read. Um, or I've, um, just stopped, you know, whatever it is. Like, I don't, I don't film a lot of stuff for Instagram anymore because I don't find it fun. So it is what it is. <laughs> yep. Yep. But you're focusing on other things. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, Hillary, thank you so much. Um, again, the website is pullingcurls.com. If you want to go reference it, I'll also include um, a link to the, uh, the blog post you wrote for nichepursuits.com, which probably has some details we didn't cover. I did read it before the interview, but um, I've been so immersed in our conversation that we'll include that and you can go read it. There's probably some other uh, great details in there. Um, yeah, it talks you. more about like my um, like my income and like how it grew. And if you go to Pulling Curls, it's not my thing anymore, but I did income reports from the very first like Google check, AdSense check up until I hit about $10,000 a month. So if you're looking to be like, what what exactly did you do as you grew this thing? They are on there. It's under like miscellaneous because it's not it's not like one of my three pillars, but it is yeah. there. And I think a lot of people find it really helpful to know that it just takes a lot of hard work and consistency and it's a job. <laughs> well, perfect. That's more reason for people to go over to the website and check it out. People love a good income report, especially in the yeah. early days when they can see the track record now of success, but you know, it's so encouraging to, dive into something at the beginning and see where it started. You know, people are not yep. alone in that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Hillary, thank you so much for coming on today to the Niche Pursuits podcast. All the best. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks so much, Jared. Have a good day. Yeah. Again, a big thanks to Ahrefs for sponsoring today's podcast. Ahrefs is an all-in-one SEO tool set. They help you get more traffic from Google by helping you understand what you need to fix on your website. Now you could hire this out to a, a costly consultant, or you could go and hire an expensive audit agency, or you could use the power of Ahrefs Webmaster Tools. It's a free resource that's gonna help you prioritize those optimization opportunities on your site. In the long run, that's going to lead to more traffic from Google, which is a good thing. <laughs> it, uh, the tool helps you see which keywords your pages are ranking for, helps you understand how Google is seeing your content, and helps you discover how making changes can blow up your traffic. Imagine what this could do for you in the long run. So again, thanks to Ahrefs for helping us with the podcast today, and you can learn more about this free tool by visiting ahrefs.com slash webmaster dash tools. Again, that's ahrefs.com slash webmaster dash tools. Have you been frustrated with your Google traffic lately? Are you tired of tools that make you search through millions of keywords and require a math degree to figure out? There's an SEO tool called Rank IQ that can help. They're ranked number one on G2 for both ease of use and customer satisfaction. Rank IQ gives you a list of the lowest competition, high traffic keywords in your niche, and they're all clear winners. When you choose one of their hand-picked keywords, their AI takes over and gives you a simple report telling you what Google wants you to cover in your blog post. Whether you have a new site or have been around for a while, Rank IQ will take your Google traffic to a whole new level. Go to rankiq.com slash niche pursuits to lock yourself in at 50% off their monthly rate. I'll put this special link in the episode's description.